history rarely favours a dictator. Over the decades, we've seen the same story repeated in many nations around the world. This exclusive list has names such as the Kim Dynasty in North Korea, Putin, some may say, Gaddafi in his time, the Assad family in Syria, and the list goes on. The story of a dictator has been played out many times over the years, and the outcome is always the same. In this video, which is the first in a series of world dictators, which I will be releasing over the next few weeks, we'll be taking a look at the downfall of the now deceased African dictator, Robert Mugabe. Welcome to News Breakdown. If this is the first time you're joining me, please consider hitting the subscribe button and push the bell notification button so that you don't miss a video. If you're listening to the audio version on whatever podcast platform you're listening on, please hit that subscribe button. A liberation hero in the struggle for independence who transformed himself into a murderous despot, some may say, and at one point he became the oldest head of state in the world. During his time in power, it is widely reported that Mugabe arrested and tortured anyone who opposed him and his ways of ruling. He squeezed the economy of Zimbabwe into an astounding negative growth and a billion percent inflation, which was never heard of. He is accused of funneling a juicy cut for himself using currency manipulation and offshore accounts. With all that said, I believe there was good intentions at the beginning of his long reign when he won the first election of a free Zimbabwe. After a bitterly fought war in the Zimbabwean bush against the oppressive Rhodesian government, Mugabe was part of a group of organisers and leaders that led the various guerrilla groups that formed Zimbabwe's Liberation Army. The two main groups that were fighting against the Rhodesian government was ZANU, which was led by Mugabe himself, and ZAPU, which was led by a late Joshua Mukomo. Mugabe was from the dominant Shona people of Zimbabwe, and once a victory was declared over the Rhodesian government, the path was already carved for him to become the first leader of the newly formed Zimbabwe. However, in the preceding years, his political career paints a portrait of disheartening decline of a man who was once viewed as one of Africa's leading men. He was born in a small rural town called Gautama in then Southern Rhodesia, a British colony to a poor family. This was just months after Southern Rhodesia had become a British crown colony. As a result, the people of his village were oppressed by the new laws and faced limitations to their education and job opportunities. His father was a carpenter who went to work at a Jesuit mission in South Africa when Mugabe was just a boy and mysteriously never came home. Mugabe's mother, a teacher, was left to bring up Mugabe and his three siblings on her own. Although many people in southern Rhodesia went only as far as grammar school, Mugabe was fortunate enough to receive a good education. He attended school at the local Jesuit mission under the supervision of a teacher director called Father O'Hare. A powerful influence on the young Mugabe, O'Hare taught Mugabe that all people should be treated equally and educated to the fulfilment of their abilities. Mugabe's teachers, who called him a clever lad at the time, were early to recognise his abilities as considerable. The values that O'Hare imparted to his students resonated with Mugabe, prompting him to pass them on by becoming a teacher himself. Over the course of nine years, he studied privately while teaching a number of mission schools in southern Rhodesia. Mugabe continued his education at the University of Fort Hare in South Africa, graduating with a Bachelor of Arts degree in History and English in 1951. In total, during his life, Mugabe managed to amass seven degrees. It is evidence that he was an extremely clever man with an appetite for educating himself. In 1958, Mugabe moved to Ghana to work as a teacher after obtaining his local certification to teach in Ghana. During his time in Ghana, he met his first wife, Sally Hayfron. Mugabe was quoted as saying at the time, I went to Ghana for an adventure. I wanted to see what it would be like in an independent African state. Ghana had been the first African state to gain independence from European colonial powers and under the leadership of Kwame Nkrumah, Ghana underwent a range of African nationalist reforms. Mugabe reveled in this environment. In tandem with his teaching, Mugabe attended the Kwame Nkrumah Ideological Institute. Mugabe later claimed that it was in Ghana that he finally embraced Marxism. In 1960, Robert Mugabe returned to Rhodesia, planning to introduce his fiancée to his mother. 
unexpectedly upon his arrival, Mugabe encountered a drastically change to southern Rhodesia. Tens of thousands of black families had been displaced by the new colonial government and the white population had exploded. The government denied the black majority rule, resulting in the violent protests. Mugabe was too outraged by the denial of blacks' rights. In July 1960, he agreed to address the crowd at the protest March of 7000, staged at a Salisbury Harare town hall. The purpose of the gathering was for members of the opposition movement to protest the recent arrest of their leaders. Going ahead in the face of police threats, Mugabe told the protesters about how Ghana had successfully achieved independence through Marxism. Just weeks later, Mugabe was elected public secretary of the National Democratic Party. In accordance with the Ghanaian models, Mugabe quickly assembled a militant youth league to spread the word about achieving black independence in Rhodesia. The government at the time in southern Rhodesia banned the party at the end of 1961, but the remaining supporters came together to form a movement that was the first of its kind in Rhodesia. The Zimbabwe African People's Union, also known as ZAPU, which soon grew to a staggering 450,000 members. The union's leader, Joshua Mkomo, was invited to meet with the United Nations who demanded that Britain suspend their constitution and readdress the topic of majority rule. But as time passed and nothing had changed, Mugabe and others were frustrated that Mkomo didn't insist on a definite date for changes to the constitution. So great was his frustration at the time that by April of 1961, Mugabe publicly discussed starting a guerrilla war, even going as far as to declare defiantly to a policeman, we are taking over this country and will not put up with this nonsense. In 1963, Mugabe and other former supporters of Mkomo founded their own resistance movement called the Zimbabwe African National Union, also known as ZANU in Tanzania. Back in southern Rhodesia later that year, the police arrested Mugabe and sent him to Wawa prison. Mugabe would remain in jail for over a decade, being moved from Wawa prison to the Sikombela detention center and later to the Salisbury prison. In 1964, while in prison, Mugabe relied on secret communications to launch guerrilla operations toward freeing southern Rhodesia from British rule. In 1974, Prime Minister Ian Smith allowed Mugabe to leave the prison and go to a conference in Lusaka, Zambia. Mugabe instead escaped back across the border to southern Rhodesia, assembling a troop of Rhodesian guerrilla trainees along the way. The battles raged on throughout the decade. By the end of the decade, Zimbabwe's economy was in worse shape than ever. In 1979, after Ian Smith had tried to reach an agreement with Mugabe, the British agreed to monitor the changeover to black majority rule and the UN lifted sanctions. By 1980, southern Rhodesia was liberated from British rule and became the independent Republic of Zimbabwe. Running under ZANU party banner, Mugabe was elected Prime Minister of the New Republic after running against Joshua Mukomo. In 1981, a battle broke out between ZANU and ZAPU due to their differing agendas. In 1985, Mugabe was re-elected as the fighting continued. In 1987, a group of missionaries were tragically murdered by Mugabe's supporters. This incident led to Mugabe and Mukomo to agree to merge their unions into the ZANU Patriotic Front, also known as the ZANU-PF, and focus on the nation's economic recovery. Within just a week of the unity agreement, Mugabe was appointed president of Zimbabwe. He chose Joshua Mukomo as one of his senior ministers. Mugabe's first major goal was to restructure and repair the country's economy. In 1989, he set out to implement a five-year plan which slackened price restrictions for the farmers allowing them to designate their own prices. By 1994, at the end of the five-year period, the economy had seen growth in the farming, mining and manufacturing industries. Mugabe additionally managed to build clinics and schools for the black population. Also, over that course of time, Mugabe's wife, Sally, passed away, freeing him to marry his mistress, Grace Marufu, who will play a major part in this compelling story. So we're going to be splitting this episode into two parts. This is part one out of two of the World Dictators series and we're focusing on Robert Mugabe within this first episode. 
however if you're watching this video on youtube and you're not subscribed to the channel please hit that subscribe button and make sure that you do hit that bell notification button so that you don't miss the second installment in this series as well as if you're listening to the audio version on whatever podcast platform you're listening to please hit that subscribe button thank you so much for watching news breakdown Thank you.